Hey, welcome back to Physics 272. That is totally allowed because that's how I feel about this course. So yeah, welcome back to Physics 272. And you say, Woo! Woo! All right, good. So last time we talked about how charge is conserved. And what this means is that the net charge of the universe may not be changed. That means I add up all the positive charges and I subtract all the negative charges. And whatever that number is, don't really know what it is, but whatever it is cannot change. You can create and destroy charge as long as you do it in plus minus pairs. Okay? We also looked at scotch tape and how when I peel it apart it gets charged. We discerned which side was the positively charged side, which side was the negatively charged side. And then we said it's up to material scientists to tell us why one happened the way it did. But once we had our charged tapes, we saw that there was an interaction between my hand and the tape, right? I actually did ground myself. I would, I would touch a conductor which grounded myself. And at the end of this lecture, you'll be able to understand why it is I was able to ground myself, why it is charges flow inside of a human. And we saw there was an interaction between my hand and the charged tape. Was it attractive or repulsive? Attractive. It, it was attractive. attractive, OK? Do you remember why it was attractive? The tape was charged. I was not charged. Why was there an attraction? Yeah, there was an induced polarization. So when my hand got close enough, there was an induced polarization. And in fact, we saw that neutral atoms are attracted by point charges, and the force between them goes like 1 over r to the fifth. So a point charge gives off an electric field that falls off like 1 over r to the what? Just a single point charge, nothing else. Point charge falls off like 1 over r to the, to the squared. That's right, 1 over r squared. The electric field of a dipole falls off like 1 over r to the to the third, OK? So these two together, a dipole with a charge, an induced dipole with a point charge, fell off total like 1 over r to the fifth. It was essentially the multiplication of those two, 1 over r squared times 1 over r cubed. OK, so that's why neutral objects are, are attracted to charged objects. It's an induced polarization. Do you have any question about last time? OK? All right. Today, we're going to learn about insulators and conductors. OK? And insulators, in insulators, electrons stay close to their own atoms. In conductors, the charges will flow like a liquid. OK? And in fact, they are formally a liquid. I'll tell you a little bit more about that. We'll see that inside of any conductor, in equilibrium, I'll tell you what an equilibrium means, but inside of any conductor in equilibrium, the net total electric field has to be 0. We'll learn about ionic solutions and metals. And if we have time, I, we may get to charging and discharging objects if we move fast enough. So first, let's review dipoles. This is not a clicker question, but we'll just review dipoles real quick here. I have an electric dipole set up. There's a plus Q at the top, a minus Q at the bottom. It exerts an electric field in space such that electric field points away from positively charged objects and points toward negatively charged objects. So the dipole field goes like this. And up here on axis, I've oriented this so that vertical is the y-axis. Up here on axis, far from the dipole, the electric field looks like 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times 2 sq over r cubed. And it's pointing away from the positive charge. So this sq is the dipole moment. Q is the charge on one end of the dipole. S is the distance between the positive and negative charges. Okay? Do you have any questions about that? OK? All right. And then down here in the bisecting plane, there's a different equation. It's just that the electric field has to flip sign there, right? Because it has to come out of the top of the dipole and then back in at the bottom. So here, it's got to be pointing downward. So that's that minus sign in the bisecting plane. And there's a factor of two between these guys. The electric field is a little bit weaker in that bisecting plane than it is if you're right straight on axis. OK? So remembering all of that, let me say that I put a dipole here. So let me fix a dipole right there. And I want to think about at the position x, what would another dipole prefer to do? How would it tend to orient itself? So what do you think about that? And this is not a clicker question yet. Which way does this guy want to point? So think of a dipole there that can just kind of rotate and spin around. And which of those orientations does it really want to take? What's its preferred orientation? OK, all right, I heard a C. All right, and, and why? OK, all right, I hear an A. But the real question is why, right? So think about this. I have a dipole here that's fixed. Which way does the electric field point at x? OK, it points downward. 
So which one of these dipoles would be happiest, let's say, in a downward pointing electric field? Yeah, C, because positive charges tend to run along the field, negatives tend to run against. That just goes back to force equals charge times electric field. Remember that, F equals QE. So a positive charge follows the field, a negative charge runs against it. So this guy's going to be the happiest there. All right, now which way does the dipole point? I just flipped it. I flipped, I flipped now so that the, the dipole I'm holding constant has the negative up top. This isn't a trick question. <laughs> so now which way does this guy point? It's A, OK? Now, if I did something like this, if I take the dipole that I'm controlling, and let me, let me put a dipole at position x that's free to rotate in any direction, but must stay at position x. And now I'm going to hold this dipole and flip it back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. What happens to this dipole here? Yeah, it fluctuates back and forth in response, OK? This is actually the source of some really cool chemistry and physics that happens at surfaces. Um, it's called Van der Waals forces. Has anybody heard of the Van der Waals interaction in chemistry? OK. And they probably wrote down kind of a complicated looking energy uh, for what the Van der Waals force looks like. But the physical origin of it is these fluctuating dipole moments. So for example, these two atoms are neutral, all right? And around an atom, there's a cloud of electrons that are zooming around. On average, this, this neon atom, for example, on average has a spherically symmetric electron shell, okay, but the electrons are zooming around. If we had a camera fast enough, which we do not, but if we had a camera fast enough to take a picture of the electrons at any instant, we would see that they're just kind of in a particular random arrangement, although when they zoom around, they make a big symmetric ball. But in any instant, they're on one side or the other of the nucleus. So in any instant, there's a slight dipole associated with any atom. And this slight dipole is fluctuating all the time. As these two atoms get close to each other, they synchronize the fluctuations of their dipole moments, such that the dipoles tend to stay anti-aligned, right? That's what you told me on the slide before, because if, if the dipole has the positive charge up top, then the electric field over here points down. It tends to, to anti-align. So they, they make temporary dipoles. They see each other fluctuating, and that causes a slight attraction. And that's the Van der Waal force. And it happens to be how geckos work. Has anybody ever had a pet gecko? OK. Has anybody ever lived somewhere where geckos entered your house periodically? And those guys crawl on the ceiling, yes? There they are, just crawling along on the ceiling. How do they do it? They don't have scotch tape. They actually do it by Van der Waals interactions. So if, you, uh, if you've ever seen geckos, um, their feet kind of lay down like this and then curl up again and then lay down and curl up. Okay? It's because their feet are very sticky. And people have studied gecko feet in order to try to understand how can we build better adhesives, adhesives that never wear out. Okay? And so on the bottom of gecko's feet are some hairs called setae that split and split and split and split. So it's the most split in hair you ever saw. And it makes all this surface area on the bottom of the gecko feet. And then all that surface area smooshes into the nooks and crannies of whatever surface it's trying to step on. And then the atoms and molecules get close enough to do that fluctuation dipole thing, which causes a weak interaction, a weak attraction. And that's the Van der Waals force, OK? And I really don't know how someone figured this out, whether it was a calculation or an experiment. Let's hope it was a calculation. But I'm told that four gecko feet can hold a human, OK? That's, they're pretty strong. Do you have any questions about that? OK? All right, here's our clicker question. Get out your clickers and turn them on and warm up your clicker fingers. So here's the question. I've put up here the equations for uh, a dipole. Either, either it's electric field on axis far from the dipole or in the bisecting plane far from the dipole. So here's the question. I gave you a more complicated setup now. I'm going to hold two dipoles fixed in space and look again at the position x. Which way does that dipole at position x tend to want to point? So answer first on your own, and I won't grade it until we have time uh, to, to get to the correct answer together. All right, so go ahead and take 30 seconds to convince your neighbor that your answer is correct. This is tricky. Do you need a little bit more time to discuss? More time? 
All right, this one's tricky, isn't it? Okay, but we'll get there. So tell me what you're thinking. And by the way, the answers, I can see your, your answers on my computer, and they're all over the map. So let's draw out all the lines of reasoning and figure out which one we should go with. Okay, so what are you thinking? What's, what's a line of reasoning that gets me to an answer up here? And again, we're not after the correct answer yet, but we want to be able to evaluate the various lines of reasoning and figure out which one we should go with ultimately. Yeah? Like I was thinking, like, if we just take away the bottom one, like, think of the Okay, all right, so there's, um, it's complicated, right? Because this guy would tend to align it down, this guy would tend to align it up, and now we have to figure out what the thing actually does. Yes, Ozzy. I, I said A. Okay. Okay, all right, you wanted an E. Okay, that's always allowed, right? I think you have an E. You can always do a protest vote. Okay, and you're doing, okay, so let me see if I got this right. He's going to choose the A um, for lack of a better option because there's a factor of two between these guys. Is that it? Okay, and so you're thinking because of the factor of two, the stronger one must win out, and that's the field exerted by this guy. Okay, all right. All right, are there other lines of reasoning we need to draw out? This is complicated. So the other things we need to consider? Yes? If you just look at the net electric field, it would be A. Okay, all right, so let me see if I got this line of reasoning correct. This dipole exerts an electric field down at x. This dipole exerts an electric field up at x. So I have to add two vectors that are, that are vertical, okay? And it turns out that you're saying the one pointing up is stronger, and yeah. so the net is, is net up. Yeah. All right, so also one, another thing to keep in mind, um, there's a, there's, you're right that this is difficult because it does it want to go up or does it want to go down, and a lot of people chose these sideways configurations, but here's something really important to think about, and I encourage you to draw the vectors on this, okay, and, and convince yourself that this is correct, but I've got things set up such that these are the high symmetry points, right? So this guy is on axis with respect to the lower dipole. It's on the bisecting plane of the other dipole. So this dipole exerts a field directly up, smack on the y-axis, pointing up. This guy exerts a field down, also smack on the y-axis, pointing down. There's no x or z component coming in. So when I add those two vectors, I have to get something on the y-axis. Does that make sense? That the net electric field must be on the y-axis. We just have to figure out, is it up or down? Okay. So a vector pointing this way and a vector pointing this way will never add to give me something sideways. Right? Okay. So that actually rules out these sideways guys. Okay. As long as everything's set up exactly at the symmetry points, which is how it's, how it's set up. Okay. So now we think about the fact that this guy is exerting a field up. This guy's exerting a field down. However, this tells us that the on-axis field is twice as strong as the bisecting plane field. Right? So we're going to, to choose that it, it tends to orient however, however it would um, tend to be here. Okay? So that gives us answer A. Do you have any questions about that? That was complicated. And this is definitely one of those uh, questions that it would be really good to review tonight. Right? Um, so answer A. I'm going to close the clicker question. In three, two, one, everybody hit A, A, A. I want you to do well. Okay. All right. Good. Okay. Now, I'm, I like this course a lot, but I'm particularly excited about today because we talk about different materials. And my field of research as a scientist is condensed matter physics. And condensed matter physics is stuff you can touch. Okay, that's my field. So if it's a material that you can touch, that you encounter in your everyday life, if you can hold it in your hand or pour it in a glass, it falls under the category of condensed matter physics. And we mean condensed in the sense of condensation, as in gas condenses to liquid, liquid condenses to solid. So condensed matter physics is about stuff you can touch, but we're also about phases of matter and phase transitions. Okay? And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, What's left to do? Hasn't that been done? OK, what are the phases of matter that you know about? What kind of phases of matter are there? Yeah? Solid, liquid, gas, plasma. OK, I hear solid, liquid, gas, plasma. That's what they taught you. Yep. Bose-Einstein condensates? Yes, Bose-Einstein condensates. So we'll add another one. All right, Bose-Einstein condensates. Very cool. Others? OK, so, um, do you mean maybe a superfluid? You can also super, you can super cool and superheat things. Yes, well, there's at least two in what you just said. So there's superfluids, 
which is if I take a bunch of helium atoms and cool them enough, they'll turn into a superfluid with no viscosity, meaning that, and you shouldn't do this because it's way too cold, but if you could stick your finger in it and attempt to stir a superfluid with no viscosity, it would feel like nothing, right? Honey is very viscous, water is less viscous, superfluids have nothing, <laughs> okay? It's just, it just wouldn't feel like anything. Or you can supercool or superheat things uh, as well. Other phases, so that's a lot of phases of matter we just thought of. Does anybody have a device with a liquid crystal display? Anybody? Yes, you do. Everybody's got a liquid crystal display. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much for pointing that out. Everyone raise your eye clickers. Liquid crystal display. Liquid crystals, what is up with that? They're liquid, they're crystal, what are they? Okay, they're actually a separate phase of matter. They are liquid in one direction, they flow in one direction, and they're crystalline in the other direction. They don't flow in the other direction. So isn't that interesting? It's like an oriented liquid. And there's tons of liquid crystal phases. That they have exotic names like pneumatics, smectics, hexatics, cholesterics, not hysterics, cholesterics. But there's a ton of liquid crystal phases. So there's many more phases of matter than they told you about in high school. And that's the, the, that's the scope of my field. I specifically work on, okay, so solid liquid gas, but we just added a lot more than solid liquid gas, right? I specifically work on what electrons do inside of solids, which is what we're going to discuss today in lecture. So what electrons do in solids is they have their own phases of matter and phase transitions inside of a solid. I'm not sure how that advanced on its own. All right, so electrons inside of a solid have their own phases of matter and phase transitions. You actually are already familiar with this. So think about a metal. So think about a, a copper wire. And if I apply a, a, a voltage to that copper wire, what happens to the electrons inside? They move, right? They, 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 there's a current that runs. And Anything like that that can flow is a liquid, and we formally, mathematically describe that thing as a liquid. So there's an electron liquid inside of a metal. Whereas in an insulator, okay, so take that with this um, styrofoam cup, all right, um, and if I apply a voltage to that, the electrons don't flow, they don't move around and carry a current, they're stuck. So in an insulator, the electrons are in a solid-like phase of matter. There's an actual phase transition that electrons undergo to get from insulating behavior that's solid-like to metallic behavior that is liquid-like. There's an actual phase transition. And there are other phase transitions uh, of, of electrons in matter. Magnets, anybody here have a magnet? I love magnet toys. I have kids, and, and I'm excited that uh, I get to have magnet toys again in my household. They're really just for the kids, right? So anyway, I like magnets a lot. And if you took a magnet and you heated it up in an oven hot enough, all right, eventually, eventually at a really, really high temperature, your magnet would just melt into a little puddle. But way before it does that, at some intermediate temperature where it's still a solid, it would snap, lose its magnetization entirely. And then if you cooled it down again, it would snap, regain its magnetization. Any snap thing like that that happens at a specific temperature is a phase transition. And so that's a magnetic phase transition. The electrons are completely changing their behavior um, as you go across that transition into the magnetic phase. Superconductors are another example. And in fact, once you get to what electrons do in sol inside of solids, there is no end in sight. There's an infinite number of phases of matter of what electrons do inside of solids. That's my field. I invented a new phase of matter a, a while back. Nobody's found it yet, but you know, maybe they will one day. It's called a, a vortex smectic, anyway. Um, so electrons inside of materials have a lot of different things they can do. In this class, we'll focus on some simple stuff. We'll focus on insulators and conductors. In an insulator, like we said, the charges don't move around. They're bound to their atoms, OK? So the charges are bound to the atoms or molecules inside of an insulator. In a conductor, the charges can flow throughout the material much like a liquid, and that's how we describe those, those charges, as a liquid. So here's an analogy. The analogy is, uh, think of the electrons inside of these materials as like little puppy dogs, OK? And so in, a, in an insulator, it's like the little electrons are, are, are like little puppy dogs on a leash tied to each atom, OK? They can yip, 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 move around, but they can't break their chain and actually flow away. Whereas uh, the electrons inside of a conductor are much like this happy little puppy, can run anywhere, all right, as long as they stay in the material. So it's like they have a little fence around the outside of the material, but other than that, they're a free range puppy and can just run around inside the material. So charges can flow throughout the material in a conductor. In an insulator, they're on a little, short little leash tied to each atom, okay? Questions about that difference, okay? 
And that's because I found too many pictures of cute puppies. I'm actually a cat lover, not a dog lover. So this is a tribute to you know, cute little puppies in, in, in other people's lives. I'm, I'm a cat person myself. So polarization of insulators. Insulators, electrons are bound to the atoms or molecules. They're like little puppies on a leash that can move a little bit, yip, 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 but can't break the leash and run away. So what happens then if I take an insulator and apply an electric field to the substance? So let me apply an electric field, OK? The charges will tend to shift a little bit, right? In response to an electric field, charges shift, all right? And so each electron shifts slightly, OK? Very, very slightly. I say less than one angstrom here, but it's, it's much, much, much smaller shift than that. However, the net effect in the entire material, in one hunk of material, there's about 10 to the 23 atoms or so. That's a lot of atoms, OK? So in that big hunk of material, if all the little electrons shift just a little bit, that's a big net effect. And so the net effect can be large when I polarize a material. But here's kind of a microscopic picture of how I should think about those atoms or molecules. If I bring a point charge nearby, it'll exert a field. And then that causes each of those to polarize, OK? The electrons get drawn toward the point charge a little bit. So each of the electrons shifts just a bit, but it can't escape its atom or molecule. Do you have any questions about that so far? OK. So what this means is that that net shift causes uh, measurable effects at the surfaces. So at the surface then of, uh, of an insulator, when I've got a net electric field applied, I would measure that there's a net surface charge down here okay, of, that's negative and a net surface charge at the top that's positive. And um, there's a way to quantify how large is the surface charge. So if I think of there being a net positive surface charge up here, and a net negative surface charge down here, then there's a net polarization to the material. And uh, I've put up here uh, our equation for polarization. P is polarization. Alpha is the polarizability times the applied electric field. So we used that equation for an atom before. We said that in each atom, there's a particular polarizability alpha. I apologize, this is labeled incorrectly. P is polarization. Alpha is the polarizability. Okay, P is the polarization. So in a particular atom, I apply an electric field, it polarizes. One way to describe that is to say for a given applied electric field, there's a net dipole moment P that that atom then has induced in it. And if you're a quantum chemist, you can calculate for us what that alpha should be. What's the proportionality constant? Okay? Or you can do the measurement, and, and, uh, and you'll get the more or less the same answer. Now, Inside of a real material, this is complicated because I apply an electric field, all right? There's an electric field I apply, but now everything gets polarized inside the material. There's little dipole moments everywhere. Each of those dipole moments is putting out an electric field as well, which now is going to be a very complicated set of net electric fields. Very difficult to calculate. However, it turns out that in, in real materials and insulators, typically the applied electric field is much, much greater than whatever net field the dipoles themselves are putting out. Does that make sense that there's an applied field, but what the dipole actually does is the whole field, right? It doesn't distinguish. It has no way to know, right? Think of yourself as a dipole inside of a material. You have no way to know where that electric field's coming from. All you know is there's a net electric field. I better shift, OK? You don't know whether I applied that field in the lab or whether it's being exerted by your neighbor due to a dipole field. However, it turns out that in typical situations, uh, for small applied electric fields, then the dipole response is weak enough that the biggest effect is the applied field. And we can make the approximation then that the total electric field inside the material is the electric field that we applied. Okay? So we'll use that approximation throughout the course. Do you have any questions about that? OK? All right. In conductors, it's a different type of response, as you might imagine. So inside of a conductor, the charges are free to move. It's much more like this happy puppy who's not on a leash but has a fence, we'll say. The fence goes around the material, and the electrons can run around inside the material. So the charges can flow throughout the material. Uh, examples of conductors are metals, like copper, uh, or ionic solutions. So this, for example, is how you might think of, say, salt water. OK, salt water, the uh, sodium and chloride, chloride atoms uh, dissociate, and then they have a, a net charge on each of them, and they can flow around. 
So I'll get some positive ions and some negative ions, and they can flow in different directions. When I apply an electric field, remember how the charges respond. Force is charge times applied field, okay, or times net field in that area. So a positive charge uh, gets pushed along the electric field. So if there's an electric field pointing, I guess here it's pointing this direction, positive charges flow along the field. A negative charge, OK, feels a force in the opposite direction because force is charge times field. And a negative charge has a negative sign there. So electrons flow in the opposite direction. So positive charges follow the field. Negative charges uh, go against the field. And inside of any conductor, the charges flow like a liquid. OK. so. Inside of a conductor in equilibrium, deep in the, in the inside of it, we'll find the result that the total net electric field inside of a conductor, once everything's settled down, turns out to be zero. Okay? Unlike the insulator, the insulator had kind of a weak response. So if I apply a net electric field to an insulator, in the interior of the insulator, there is still a net electric field in there, which is very, very close to the actual field that I applied. Um, inside of a conductor, it actually becomes zero. All right, so we'll see how that's true. It's a little hard sometimes to, to prove a zero, but, but I'll show you how we'll do it here. We want to prove that the charges inside of a conductor will move until there's no electric field left to push them around. Okay, so let me tell you what I mean by equilibrium. It's here on the side. Equilibrium means nothing moves. There's something else called steady state. Steady state means that the current is constant. OK, so here's, we're going to use what's called proof by contradiction in order to prove this. So proof by contradiction goes like this. Number one, assume the opposite is true. Number two, show that the opposite is self-contradictory and therefore can't be true. OK, so here's what that looks like here. We say, assume that there's some sort of static equilibrium for a conductor in which the net electric field inside of the conductor is not zero. Let's just say that could happen. If that happened, then the rest of this follows. If there is a net electric field inside of a conductor, the charges have to move in response. They're liquid. They can flow around. And they'll feel that force, and they'll flow around, and they'll move. This is not equilibrium, because equilibrium is when the charges quit moving around. So the assumption is self-contradictory. Therefore, it must be that, that proof by contradiction says that we've shown that inside of a conductor in equilibrium, the net electric field is 0. Okay. And it's basically just the idea that the charges will keep moving around until there's no electric field left to push them. And then they'll quit. Okay? Do you have any questions about that? All right. OK. Now, here's a conductor in kind of a funny shape. And we know that inside of it, it has to have a net electric field, which is 0, when it's in equilibrium, which is where there's no net movement of charges. But I could put an excess charge on it, right? I could charge the thing. So let me put some extra electrons on that conductor. What happens is that any excess charges in the conductor have to flow to the surface, OK? If they were in the interior, then they'd be feeling electric fields from each other. They'd be re repelled from each other. And they'd push themselves out to the surface until they got to the surface. And then they, there's nowhere left to go, and they get stuck there. So if you have excess charge on a conductor, it has to be found on the surface. Does that make sense? Do you have any questions about that? OK, so if I charge a conductor, then the charges will flow to the surface. And they'll configure themselves on the surface so that the net electric field inside the conductor is 0. OK? All right. What about an inner surface? So let's have a weird configuration. Here, white indicates nothing, like air or vacuum. And gray indicates a conductor. Is it possible for me to have some charge on the inside surface of a conductor? OK. All right. I'm hearing some quiet yes. All right. So there's no contradiction with that so far. All right. And, and in fact, I'm allowed to do that. I'm allowed to have excess charge on the interior surface of a, of a hollow conductor. Okay? It's a little bit strange, though, to think about, well, how would you set that up? So here's an example of how you could set that up. Give me a point charge. Give me a positive point charge. Okay? And now enclose that positive point charge with a spherical conductor. Okay? Since there's a positive point charge in the middle, the electrons in the conductor will, tend, will be attracted to that positive point charge. So I'll actually gather a little bit of negative charge on the interior of the conductor. 
That leaves a net positive charge on the exterior of the conductor. But at the end of the day, all the net charge went to the surfaces, either the exterior surface or the interior surface. Okay? And then in equilibrium, once everything starts, stops moving, the interior of the conductor still has zero net electric field. Do you have any questions about that? Okay, so the two basic ideas are that in a conductor, uh, the charges can flow. So inside of a conductor, if I apply an electric field, the charges will move until there's no field left to push them. So that's why there's no net electric field inside the conductor. If you do get excess charges, they'll just run to the surface and they'll distribute themselves so as to enforce that there's no electric field inside the bulk of the material. You have, you have a question? Yes. Okay. Are you saying that there will be uh, you know, charge induced on the, on the inner walls of this conductor? Okay, so in the configuration I have, the question is, am I saying there will be charges induced on the walls of this conductor? Is that your question? Yes. So if I think of this configuration where I have a hollow spherical conductor, and here I've surrounded it by another hollow spherical conductor. Let's imagine sticking a point charge in the middle. So let me stick a proton right in the middle, smack in the middle. What will happen to, the, to this closest conductor is that the electrons will get attracted to the inside. So I'll get a net negative charge here in the middle. And then that will expose a positive charge out here. Then altogether, what does this outside conductor see? It sees a net positive charge as well. And so it will have the same kind of thing happen. So yeah, it polarizes the conductor. Is that, is that your question? Yeah. Good. Good question. All right. Other, other thoughts or questions? OK. All right. Now, now we're going to discuss uh, a, a model of a metal, a way to think about how uh, electric fields affect metals. So inside of a, a, the metals that, that we're used to in everyday life are things like copper, that sort of thing. If you look closely enough at the atomic structure, it does tend to be a regular array. Copper atoms like to, to sit in a crystalline structure. That's a little bit contrary to your experience because you're used to metals being flexible and being malleable and that sort of thing. But if you look at the local atomic arrangement, it still very much likes to be in, in a crystal. So we'll think of it that way. Think of the interior of a metal as having a regular arrangement of atoms. And then the electrons form a C around that. The electrons are liquid-like and form a C and can flow. Now, if I think about any particular real metal like a, like a copper atom, does anybody remember how many electrons are associated with a copper atom? Let's just say a lot, OK? No chemists sitting up front. OK, so a lot. So for the most part, most of those electrons are deep inside the atomic cores and stuck to their atoms. But the highest lying electron is the thing that can pop off and contribute to the electron C and run all throughout the material. And in fact, it's very much like chemical bonding, right? If I take two atoms that come near each other, their topmost electrons can come off and share a molecular orbital. If I add another atom, it can do the same thing. That topmost electron can pop off and be shared throughout the three atoms. And if you give me three atoms, you have to give me an infinite number of atoms. You can add another atom, and it'll do the same thing. The electrons get shared in one big molecular orbital. Now just extend that molecular orbital idea to the entire crystal. That's what these electrons are doing. They are moving throughout the entire material. The topmost electron from each atom is moving throughout the entire material. And that's what's forming for you uh, the mobile electron C. So these electrons act like a liquid, and they can flow. Now. Uh, when I apply an electric field, then, I can think about the two together. So here's our model of a metal. There's these positive atomic cores that are in a regular lattice arrangement. There's the electron C that can flow like a liquid. And if I apply an electric field, so here in this diagram, I'm applying an electric field pointing to the right. Then uh, the electron C responds by moving against that electric field. That gives me a net negative charge on this side of the material and a net positive charge on that side of the material. Okay? But those charges will arrange themselves so that the net electric field equals what inside of a conductor? What is the uh, net electric field inside of a conductor? Zero, Zero right? So in, in equilibrium, once things settle down. So if this is an isolated hunk of material and I apply that electric field, then I'll get a net negative charge here, a net positive charge here. Those positive and negative charges form a big dipole, which exerts an electric field. All right? So this is the polarization field due to the response of the metal. The polarization field is in the opposite direction to the applied field. Okay? 
Does that make sense that the polarization field is in the opposite direction? I can, I can uh, say that the net charge in the middle is zero, the edge charge here is positive, and the electric field has to point away from the positive charges, right? And then it points towards the negative charges. So the polarization of the material itself produces an electric field inside, which is exactly canceling my applied field, okay? So that the net charge is still, sorry, the net electric field uh, inside the material is still zero, and the net charge is still zero. I haven't added or removed charge from this guy. Do you have any questions about what that looks like? Okay. So a conductor does polarize in response to an applied electric field. Right. Okay. Now, I want to think about, okay, before I get into all those equations, I want to think about what happens to electrons in a real material um, in a steady state situation. So, so far I'm talking to you about equilibrium, which is where I apply a field to a hunk of matter and then I wait long enough that um, things stop moving on average. Now I want to think about a steady state situation. We do use metals all over the place to conduct electricity. We put them in circuits and they carry electricity from one place to another. So think of a steady state situation like that. And I want to think about how that electron interacts with the atomic cores. So let's think, for example, we need an atomic lattice to think about. So let's think about the chairs in the room, OK? So each, let each uh, chair in the room represent an atomic core, OK? And now pretend you're an electron trying to make it from one side of the material to another. There's all this stuff in your way, all right? But if you were like, a, if we, let's imagine uh, that there aren't people in your way, but let's say we take a really good runner, we'll choose the best runner among us, and we'll say, look, we want you to figure out how to run on the top of these desks from one side to the other, and that runner could do it just by getting the right rhythm, right? If I look this direction and I run that direction, there's a particular rhythm at which those desks are going to move on our foot. Or if I move this direction, there's a particular rhythm I'd have to take to run up the desks that way. Don't worry, I'm not going to do it right now. I'm not a runner. Okay, all right, just, oh, I ran once, I ran cross country in college once, it was really bad. Anyway, uh, kudos to all you real runners. So let's take a real runner. Now, as long as everything's exactly in place, we could take our runner and we could blindfold them, right? They just need to know what rhythm to go, and they'll hit all those desks correctly, right? As long as they're good. We'll take a really good runner. Some people are skeptical. But no, we're going to take a really good runner, OK? Not me. Does that make sense? Electrons inside of a material essentially do this. They look out over the atomic cores. They see the periodicity. They, the electrons are quantum mechanical. They have a wave function, so they have a rhythm to how they move things. A wave function has a wave to it, has a rhythm to it. So the electrons choose a rhythm that just allows them to skip through the lattice, much like a runner would run over the tops of these desks. Okay, so that's one of the quantum mechanical tricks that electrons use to become liquid-like inside of a material. Does that make sense? Okay, all right, now, Let's take our runner again, OK? We'll take our runner. We've blindfolded our runner. Now let's play a prank on the runner, all right? The runner's running this direction, blindfolded, has the rhythm down. Their feet are meeting the top of the desks at exactly the right time because they've got the right rhythm, only we're going to move a desk out of the way. Now what happens when the runner hits the place that doesn't have a desk anymore? What happens? The runner falls over. OK, so in fact, electrons inside of a material have this happen to them as well. If the electrons are moving around at the right rhythm, expecting a particular periodicity to the atomic lattice, and they encounter a spot where the atom is missing, for example, defects happen, right? That, that's just the real world situation. There are defects in every material. And in fact, there's a thermodynamically required concentration of defects. So when that electron hits the missing atom, it actually falls over, OK? It loses its velocity. It goes back to zero velocity. And then whatever applied electric field you have on the material will have to accelerate it again. And so it'll get its rhythm, and it'll get going again, and it hits another place. Maybe there's an extra atom this time. Same thing will happen. It'll trip, OK? And the electron will lose its entire velocity and start again. So that's very much like, that's the origin of the Druda model. It's called the Druda model of um, how electrons move inside of a real material. Okay, it's like our runner, blindfolded runner, running along on these chairs. And if we move one chair out of the way, the runner will trip and fall and have to start again. So here's what that looks like for an electron. Think of, of, a, of a single electron over time and think of its speed. Okay? So in response to the electric field, 
the applied electric field, the electron gets accelerated. Its speed then increases linearly with time. All right, I'm using the momentum principle from uh, the first semester of this course from Physics 172, the momentum principle, tells you that then this velocity increases linearly with time until it hits a defect. And then smack, the electron loses its velocity and it has to start again. Okay, so smack, it lost its velocity. It starts again because there's an electric field applied to it and then smack it collides with something else and loses its velocity. And then the electric field accelerates it again. And so it does this tick, 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 tick kind of sawtooth pattern uh, for its speed versus its time. Now it's not just defects that the electron can smack into. Think about those atomic cores, okay? So think about the lattice of atomic cores inside of a real material. And now think of turning up the temperature on that material. What happens to the positions of the atomic cores as I turn up the temperature? Okay, okay, things get kind of fuzzier and, and, and a little bit bigger in extent. What else happens? Vibrate. Yes, there's vibrations. So as I turn up the temperature in the material, the atoms will vibrate. So imagine our poor blindfolded runner trying to run on the tops of these desks. That's all fine as long as there's no defects. But then if we turned up the temperature on the desks, it would be like each of the desks wiggles just a little bit. Okay? And too much wiggling will also cause our runner to trip and fall. Same thing for the electrons inside of a material. If they encounter an atom that's wiggling too much, and as I turn up the, the temperature, they're all wiggling, it'll also collide, lose its velocity, and have to start again. Okay? So these are, these are some of the things that, that contribute to those properties in real materials. Do you have any questions about that? Okay. All right, so that was the physics concept. Let's go through the equations now. So think of applying a net electric field to a metal. And what's going to happen is the speed of each electron will have this kind of sawtooth pattern. And I want to calculate the average speed. So let me just take one triangle at first. So take this triangle here. Okay, the, the velocity increases linearly with time until a collision. And I want to calculate the average velocity there. All I need to do is know that it started off with zero velocity. And then just before it collided, it had some net, some net velocity that was a, due to the applied electric field. Okay? So what's that velocity going to be? We can get it from the momentum principle. dp by dt is the net force. Here the p represents momentum. Okay? There just aren't enough letters in the world for us physicists, so here P represents momentum. Change in momentum with time is the net applied force, which in this case is QE for an electron that's negative E, negative uh, E the charge, times the uh, net electric field that it feels. So to get the change in momentum, I would say, well, at the end, just before it collided, it has a P, some momentum. It started off with zero, and that change in momentum is the charge times the applied field times the amount of time between that, that collision event. Okay, so this delta t is the base of that triangle. Now I can solve for velocity. Velocity is momentum divided by mass, as long as things are non-relativistic. Okay, electrons move quickly in a material, but they're still considered to be in the non-relativistic limit. So this is, uh, the velocity is momentum divided by mass. We already decided the momentum is charge times applied field times delta t. Okay? And again, I'm just calculating one triangle for now. All right? Now I want to take an average of all those triangles. So if I take an average of all those triangles, what can be averaged? Bar here means average. The average velocity of that electron over that, that timeline, uh, the only thing in here that can be averaged is the, the time between collisions. The charge on the electron, not going to change. The applied electric field, not going to change. The mass of the electron, not going to change. So the only thing that's different in all those triangles is the time between collisions. So if I happen to know the average time between collisions, delta t bar, then I could put it into this equation and I could tell you the average velocity. Okay? So um, if we know that, then what we can do is we can take everything out in front of the electric field here, E delta t average over mass, and we call that a new quantity. Okay? Because one of the things we'd like to know is if I apply an electric field to a material, what is the average velocity of each electron? Okay? And that's expressed in this equation. I put all this together and call it some new constant mu. Okay? This mu is called the mobility. It's just a measure of how mobile are the electrons in that material. For a given electric field, a high mobility gives me a high average velocity. Okay? Do you have any questions about that stuff, how that went? Okay? All right. All right. So 
Here's our summary sheet of conductors and insulators, all right? Comparing and contrasting how conductors and insulators um, behave in the presence of an applied electric field. Stay with me a little bit. We've got like one minute left, okay? Possibly two. No, one minute. Um, stay with me. So to, con to con wow, that advanced on its own. So to compare and contrast conductors and insulators, one has mobile charges, the other doesn't, right? So the conductor has electrons and, and other charges that are free to move. Uh, the polarization in a conductor, the whole sea of electrons, stay with me, OK? All right, the whole sea of electrons shifts a little bit. In an insulator, each individual atom has a slight polarization. In static equilibrium, the net electric field inside of a conductor is zero, whereas inside of, a, of an insulator, there will be a net applied field still. Uh, the excess charges on a conductor can only be on the surface. The charges will all run to the surface. Whereas in an insulator, they can actually be anywhere. They can, you can stick them on the surface and they'll stay there. All right, that's it for today. I'll see you guys on Wednesday.